Hello guys, welcome back to Eric's Hobby Workshop. We are in full-blown lockdown here in New York, but it just means more time for crafting and building. And we got a good project here for you today. We're going to build this ruined tower with removable top, removable roof, lots of detail, fully detailed on the inside, and it's going to be awesome. So let's get to it. I start this project with a quick sketch of what I plan to build. Making a quick sketch can give you something to work towards and save a lot of time in the long run. As you can see, it'll have a 10 cm by 10 cm base and levels of 2 and a quarter inches. There will be three levels of stonework with a timbered structure on top. The whole thing will be covered in arrow loops with a few areas of structural damage. Let's do it! First, I cut the 10 cm by 10 cm base out of medium chipboard. I'm choosing these dimensions because I plan to enter this piece in a two-week terrain competition on Instagram. It's hosted by a fellow named Joe from Encounter Terrain, and he hosts these things all the time, so I recommend checking him out if you're interested in doing something like this. I'll link him below. 10 cm by 10 cm is a great size restriction for the competition because it's small enough that you can do it in two weeks, but large enough that you can do something decently big if you want. Once I have my base, I'm going to cut some bricks out of pink EPS foam. This would be a lot easier and more precise with a Proxon or some other hot wire foam cutter, but if my channel has one message, it's this. Lack of gadgets and materials is never a good reason to not make something really cool. So let's grab a kitchen knife, craft knife, or any other kind of choppa you have at hand, and we'll make do with that. Once my bricks are cut, I throw them in a makeshift tumbler made out of a kitchen tub. Inside I've put a bunch of jagged rocks filched from the construction site next door. Shaking these together will add some weathering, texture, and dimension to each little brick. Plus, when you open it, you get this delightful mist. Mmm. <coughs> Next, I take a sketch of a door I've done on a piece of paper, and I glue it to some medium weight chipboard. This will help me block in the area where the door goes as I build. Once it's glued down, cut it out with some scissors. This is an important step. Turn your glue gun down to low. If you don't have a dual temperature glue gun, ignore what I said a moment ago about not needing certain gadgets to make something cool. You absolutely need one of these bad boys. I'll place a link in the description if you don't have one. They're inexpensive and are totally awesome. This is one thing that is really a staple for me. Anyways, let's start gluing these bricks down. Each brick should get a small bead of glue on the bottom and any side that will be up against an existing brick, just like you would apply mortar if you were a stonemason, presumably. This will eventually make a really solid wall. Don't apply so much glue that it oozes out between bricks because that will look ugly. If this does happen, just wipe it away with a finger before it dries and it'll be fine. There is a lot of brick laying ahead. In hindsight, this was certainly not the quickest way to make a stone tower, but the advantage of going brick by brick is that the inside is detailed as well, so it'll be worth it. Once we get about 2 inches up, we can add some cross beams. For these I'm using 3 16 inch basswood. Basewood, basswood, whatever. I'll link these in the description as well. I have to say, there's something deeply satisfying to me about using actual wood when doing tiny carpentry. It just feels more, uh, more real. Next, let's lay down some floorboards. For these floorboards, I'm just using coffee stir sticks. Same kind you would grab in a Starbucks to stir in your low-fat soy nectar or whatever. Just two more floors, no problem, we got this. Okay, let's make some arrow loops. I chose not to make any windows on the first floor, apart from the gaping holes in the back, but now let's make some areas from which this tower can be defended. I'm sure you've all seen arrow slits on the outside of castles, but what I thought was pretty cool is the first time I saw the inside of one. There's a lot of room to maneuver to get the right angle for your shot. So let's cut some angled pieces of foam. In reality, some arrow loops are very close to the ground for shooting downwards, but I can claim artistic license on this one and just make them kind of like window-y, kind of arrow loopy. Once that first window is made, let's make some identical copies for the other windows. I could make these out of foam too, but let's try something different. To create a mold, I'm going to use blue stuff, which is a quote-unquote new generation thermoplastic, whatever that means. This stuff is super fun to use and has a lot of potential uses, so I was dying to play around with it. Just heat it with water, press your piece in, make some divots with the end of a paintbrush, 
and wait a few minutes for that to cool. Next, make the top half by pressing it down into the bottom part. It's that easy. When this is cool, the pieces will separate fairly easily and you'll be left with a very detailed mold. Next, I mix up some milliput, which is a two-part epoxy putty, and stuff it in there. Wait three to four hours, and it's hard enough to remove from the mold. It needs a bit of tidying, but you end up with a pretty damn good copy. So let's glue some windows onto this level, and keep moving along with our bricklaying. Some tasks in this hobby of ours engage a larger percentage of the brain than the others. If you're following along with this build and haven't already left your body from astral projection, try checking out some podcasts. There's a great Necromunda related podcast called Scum City Radio on Spotify that I recommend you check out. Also, Trapped Under Plastic is a great podcast for the mini enthusiast. Okay, we've come another level up. Let's take a quick break from the bricks and make some progress on the door. I start by gluing some coffee stir sticks to the template I made using white glue. Once that's dry, I trim the excess with a pair of scissors. Okay, one final push and the stonework is done. Let's build the timbered top story. The first thing that needs to be determined is how far it will jetty out above the lower floors. I start with estimated dimensions of 13cm by 13cm just to see how it looks. It turns out it looks about just about right, so let's go with that. That was easy. So I knew I wanted my timbered beams to poke out a little bit from underneath my top floor. I also knew I needed a space in the center of the floor to make it accessible from the floors below by ladder. So after a bit of sketching, I realized I need an even number of support struts on each side to make this possible. Since my smaller floors each have three timbers jutting out, it made sense to go with the option with four beams per side plus the corners since it's a little bit larger. That'll be more detailed and leave a smaller space for the ladder to come up. Okay, so I measure some guidelines on my chipboard base and then hot glue down some parallel beams. I'm only using a small dot of glue here, just enough to keep them from moving around. Next. I cut some notches into these beams, and identical notches into the corresponding cross beams. This allows me to make this big, sort of hashtag shape. Glue that in place with a bit of white glue or carpenter's glue, then weigh that down. Then I repeat these process for some evenly spaced internal beams, and for the outside beams on the adjacent sides, I'll just glue shorter lengths into the sides. Now let's pull out some foam core board and cut the walls of this upper structure. I cut four pieces 13 centimeters by 2.25 inches. Now I know what you're thinking. Why does this maniac keep mixing metric and imperial? It's because I'm Canadian, goddammit. I'll do what I want. Next, using a razor sharp blade, I trim the corners into 45 degree angles. This will allow the corners to join flush. With this done, I hot glue the pieces together to make a nice even box. box done, I glue it down onto my beams. Now that the beams are securely attached, I remove the chipboard bottom which was only a guideline. Gone! Okay, we're starting to see where this is going. Very motivating! Onward! I take a few beams left over from the previous step and I cut them on an angle and join them together. Then I cut a third edge to the pyramid and glue that on, then a fourth, testing against the structure to make sure it looks right at each step. With these edges done, I glue some coffee stir sticks to the bottom edge to reinforce the structure so I can start to build up the roof. Once those are in place, I can tuck some more roof beams in, securing those in place with a bit more hot glue. Next, I carve the corners out and place some basswood beams in there. I make sure to leave them protruding enough to be at least flush with the planking I will add at the next step. I actually use two different thicknesses of coffee stir sticks at this stage. The thicker ones become beams that mirror the corners going vertically from above each of the floor beams protruding below. With those in place, I fill the spaces between with thinner, narrower stir sticks, leaving a slit that will become an arrow loop for the tower garrison to shoot through. With that done, I place my timbered structure back on top of the stonework and fill in some stones between the beams to make a nice snug fit. I'm not gluing the stones to the beams because I want this to be removable. 
cool. I also added this removable area of damage to the tower at the top. Okay, back to the door. Let's add some details. I start by adding some cross bracing to the front in a sort of a Z shape. Then I add a small panel for the door handle. Next, I apply a small hoop of wire for the door handle itself. Once I have the handle in place, I cut a small segment of styrene tube. Then I cut that in half to complete the latch on the door handle. For a final detail, I use the stabbing end of my compass to add some little nail holes across the cross braces. Cool. I showed my brother some work in progress shots, and he told me he thought it looked like it might be too damaged to even stand up. So this little beam here is for you, Kirk. I'm not gluing it on though, because that'll get in my way when I try to paint it later. Next, I glue some sand into the inside of the ground floor to simulate the packed earth floor and little bits of rubble and debris. Why have floorboards when you can have a dirt floor? Exactly. Speaking of floorboards, let's add some to the top floor. I keep them in a few directions to maximize the realism and detail, making sure to leave that hole in the center for the ladder. After that, I'll add some trim to the upper parts of the structure then cut notches into it to allow a nice removable push fit roof. Magnets are cool, but push fit is the epitome of elegance. With the roof in a secure spot, let's add the rest of the roofing planks. I leave a lot missing and broken to sell that ruined look. Next, take a box of TGI Friday's chicken wings. Make sure the chicken is no longer inside as it will make this next step easier. Open the box, then measure and cut yourself some 1.5 centimeter strips. When you have your strips, cut them part way with your scissors to make this shingle pattern. I didn't measure this and wasn't particularly precise, but that doesn't matter in the long run. A bit of variation looks more interesting anyways. With those notched, bend back every other shingle and trim it slightly to vary the length. Now use your hot glue gun to glue these to the roof. Starting at the bottom and moving upwards, covering half of each of the previous layer. Add a few single shingles and smaller segments to add to that ruined look. When all four sides are done, let's make some curvy shingles for the corners. Start with a 1cm strip of paper, bend it into a curve, and cut it into 1.5cm segments. Then apply these the same way as the other shingles. Okay, with that final detail done, let's paint this thing. First things first, I start by adding some black magic sauce to all the foam parts. This is a mixture made of black paint and Mod Podge, a recipe popularized by terrain legend Jeremy from Black Magic Crafts. I apply this carefully all over, making sure to get it in the cracks. This adds durability and will also protect the foam from any propellants in the aerosol cans I'm going to use in the next step. I do two good coats just to make sure. Once that's done, I take these things outside for their base coats. I use Krylon Grey for the stone and Liquitex Burnt Umber for the timbered upper portion. Wow, is that ever gratifying. With just that done, this would already look great on the table. Next, I use some Burnt Umber acrylic paint to get the internal beams and floorboards and the dirt floor at ground level. Before I paint the door, I'm going to make a quick mold of it so I can make more later if I want. I melted down the molds for the windows since I don't need them anymore. To indicate a wet environment and a bit of age and neglect, I washed the bottom few centimeters of the bottom layer with some green paints. This gives a splash of color and adds some nice detail. Next, I use a tan color to dry brush all the woodwork and the dirt on the ground floor. I used a few different shades and lightnesses to add a dusty, dirty, varied weather look. I picked out the shingles on the roof with Incubi Darkness, a paint from Games Workshop. I don't usually like to use expensive miniature paints on terrain, but the coverage and consistency is great and I really like this color, so I can live with using it here. I mix a bit of white in for a lighter dry brush and that really brings out the details. I 
paint the door with miniature paints as well because I don't want to obscure any of the detail I worked hard on earlier. I used Rhinox Hide, then dry brushed successive lighter layers of Karnak Stone mixed in. For the door handle I used Lead Belcher, then applied some Null Oil to the handle, and then I added some to the deep recesses for a little bit of depth and shade. In place, it looks pretty good. Finally, I hit the stonework with a few light dry brushes of grey. And I'm going to call that done. Awesome. This thing looks just as I imagined, gloomy and foreboding, the really grounded historical style. It looks ruined enough to fit in with my ruined Mordheim city, but intact enough to still be a tempting hideout or headquarters for any group of mercenaries or outlaws. This thing would look great on a Warhammer or Age of Sigmar table for a pitched battle. It would even look good in a historical World War II type setting for a game like Bolt Action. Why not? It also goes really well with some of the pieces I showcased in my last video, like this covered walkway. If you like this video, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Your support would allow me to make better quality builds more often. In addition, please check out the Amazon affiliate links below. If you aren't subscribed, subscribe now and hit that notification bell. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Eric's Hobby Workshop.